Welcome to The High Bar, your weekly watering hole for lighthearted conversation with people who care about culture that matters. I'm Warren Etheridge, your host and barkeep. I promise never to cut anyone off while encouraging all to think responsibly. Today, we're going to raise a toast and raise the bar for mountain climbing with my guest, Conrad Anker. Seventy-five years after Mallory and Irvin vanished, mountaineer Conrad Anker took part in an expedition looking for their bodies high on Everest. Conrad, come in, please. I'm down at 26.7, over. Anker struck off on his own. Conrad, you're way below the search zone. You need to be higher, over. I was curious. I stopped, turned around, and there was a patch of white. It wasn't snow. It was matte, a light absorbing color, like marble. As I got closer, I realized this was the body of one of the pioneering English climbers, frozen onto the mountainside. For a moment, I thought, maybe I can just keep walking and keep it to myself. But then, that's what we were there for. Group meeting. Mandatory group meeting. Over. There are many mysteries in life, including quantum physics and why Seattle lights can't merge in traffic. But the one that really befuddles me is mountain climbing. I've never gotten it. I just don't know. I don't understand. But today I am going to learn because today I have the the best guest possible. I have world famous mountaineer and star of the new IMAX movie, The Wildest Dream, with me, Conrad Anker. Thanks for being here. Warren, <laughs> thanks for having me here. <laughs> it seems like uh, deja vu at this point. But we are here at the high bar to talk about mountain climbing because hopefully you can convince me that there is a reason to do it. <laughs> is there? There is no reason. I mean, <laughs> and, at the end of the day, it's not like we're designing a better mousetrap. We're not solving world hunger. We're not making a better vaccine. But why do we really want to go do it? And I think it's because humans have this desire to explore. And that's why we are the dominant species on this planet. We've always gone over the ridge and sailed across the oceans to learn more about things. And that, that drive is still within some of us. And it hasn't left me. So going up there and climbing is part of that, that need to explore and to take on some risk and see what's on the other side. Well, the first time uh, you go up Everest, it really is to explore because you're exploring for the body of George Mallory. You are there to specifically find that, which seems a little bit like needle in a haystack. In 99. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, well, I mean, it seems like a very noble cause, but you actually go against instinct and check out a, a patch of land that you shouldn't have, essentially, and you stumble upon him. What, what do you attribute that to? Do you think you had some sort of divine moment there? Uh, luck. Um, I wasn't, I was just sort of searching in a different area and I was uh, traversing lower and I wanted to see what the mountain, what it was like. And sort of, you ha as you have in a river, you have eddies and, and there's certain areas that a body would land if they were to fall off. And that was what I was following. And, and so when you, you find him, it's, it's really intriguing to me because you find him and you have a moment's hesitation about whether or not to report your finding, even though that's what you were there for. Yeah. And, and what were you thinking? Well. I'll keep the bones for myself. Matey. Just sort of having this great secret. And I mean, imagine in Titanic when <laughs> at the end of the movie she has the big diamond, she just chucks it off the end of the boat. <laughs> you know, and after they've spent all, I mean, to have that, that mystery. I mean, that film hadn't come out then, but it, I right. guess there's maybe this in human nature to have 
some knowledge that no one else has. And that's part of that exploring gene that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, to, to push yourself, to try something different. Right. Now, to try something different, uh, and, and something I would uh, classify as uh, psychotic, you decided that the best thing for you to do is try to recreate the expedition that Mallory went on to do the, the, the climb of, of Everest in the way that he would have. In period clothing. Yes. Which <laughs> <laughs> Leather boots. Right. Wool the knickers. Wool, yeah. Right. The Aberdeen fedora. jacket. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's very different. Yeah. So, <laughs> a little you more figured challenging. it's not quite hard enough the way I'm doing it with just the world's tallest mountain. Let me make it more difficult. Well, the humans do that. They, they <laughs> always want to make it a little bit more of a challenge. So. Right. Some people see the easier path, other people try it a little more difficult. Well, this is really intriguing to me because I, I'm fascinated by climbing. Is just getting to the top enough or is there like, is it like gymnastics? Is there a degree of difficulty necessary? There's difficulty and climbers rate the climbs according right. to what they are. Everest is high altitude, so it's the lack of oxygen and the demands that has on the human physiology that make it challenging. Other cliffs are like this and there's not much to go on there. And right. They're like gymnasts, really strong fingers, just climbing up. And so we look at the difficulty on that, but it's um, probably the, the biggest reward is afterwards. When you're doing it, it's, yeah, walking up a mountain and hard to breathe and lack of food and you have a splitting headache and it's just misery. I mean, that's not fun. Right. But when you get back and you can hang out with guys like Warren and Warren's <laughs> like, man, you've climbed Everest. <laughs> So there is some sort of like benefit to that. I mean, you bought me a beer. That's, that's, wow, I could have taken care of that without Everest, but uh, I, I like that you're that indebted. Uh, so you, you, you do this, you take this climb, you go to the second step, and there's this fascinating part where uh, since Mallory attempted it, there's a ladder, which seems like cheating to me somehow. The Chinese, it, it, yeah. the Chinese put a ladder in, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and you're already a climber. If you can tell that a ladder is cheating, you can, that's the difference between a, a pure ascent and right. cheating. Well, that so. doesn't make any sense. There's a ladder there. Why not put the ladder all the way up at that point? <laughs> why, not, <laughs> why, why are we wasting time? Why Escalate. is there a ladder? Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, just ride the helicopter. Well, it, because there's, at 28,300 feet, there's an overhanging cliff. And right. to climb that at that altitude with the amount of people that are on the route, it would be tremendously difficult. So they've put the ladder there to expedite it, and the ladder's been there since 1975. Right. But when, so if you climb the mountain, you, you've gone up without the ladder. That's the, the whole thing. It's yeah. create this. You don't use the ladder. Now, surely you've met climbers who have gone up Everest who have used the ladder, haven't you? Yep. Do you look down your nose at them? Oh, no. They're awesome. They have really? a good time, yeah. So I don't care. You don't care? No. So it's not competitive. Fun. It's just competitive with yourself. Yeah, to know, okay, I did it without the ladder. Right. And it was Because the first time I did it, I stepped on the ladder, so it wasn't a pure ascent. I knew that... It was like 95% there, but I touched the ladder. So the second time we came back, we took the ladder off and then right. climbed it without. Now, if I was completely competitive and egotistical, I would say, well, I've done it. Everyone else has to do it at my standard, and I would have cartwheeled the darn ladder down the north side of Mount Everest. <laughs> right. But we put it back up. You put it back up. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, so, so you and Patrick are going up there next year, right? <laughs> That's right. I think we are. That's right. We're getting some Sherpas, and we're going. Yeah. Speaking of, this is always fascinating, particularly in mountain climbing films, is that you get these gorgeous shots. In this movie, The Wildest Dream, is no exception. We're going to have IMAX, and it's just absolutely beautiful, and it will be the closest I ever get to that. But the IMAX camera is a fairly large camera, and it means that other people are hauling that camera around up the mountain so they can take the shot of you climbing up, right? Yeah. That's, that's pretty impressive climbing, too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so the camera <laughs> needs four people to support <laughs> right, the camera in right. terms of batteries and film and all that. So it is, logistically speaking, it's a big challenge to right. get everyone up the mountain. Right. So, that's, and, but that's and, a lot. They're, they're yeah. good climbers, too. Everybody's a yeah. good climber. Yeah, you, you're... It's um, most of the time it's ca it's climbers that then learn camera skills subsequently, rather ah. than cameramen that say, "Well, I'm going to be a climber, and then I've climbed a little. I'm going to go to Mount Everest." So we can teach the climber how to use the camera rather than the other way around. Yeah, they both. I mean, we could test. <laughs> That's right. I have a few cinematographers I'd like to send up there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> show them. So so you're doing this thing. You're 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 shooting it, but unlike shooting a movie unless you're John Landis, people don't normally die during production. But climbing a mountain, people do die. It's a very dangerous sport. Plenty of people have died on Everest. Yeah. Lots of people. And, and, and forget 
dying, lots of people suffer terribly. Yeah. There's they, frostbite. There's yeah. a guy in the movie from the first expedition whose larynx is frostbitten. And he coughs I, it up. Right, and I did not realize that was possible. Yeah. And it entered a whole new realm of, of fear for me. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't want, you're in inside to stay inside. That's, yeah. my, that's my little medical tip. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so why, I agree. Yeah. So why don't you hear something like that and go like, mm, I don't know, maybe I should be a windsurfer, paraglider. Well, well those are both <laughs> dangerous sports. They are, but you, you don't freeze your larynx out. Yeah, but you can drown, and if you're scared of drowning, that's a big danger. So Are you scared <clears> of drowning? Is there something you're scared of? Oh, well, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not particularly aquatic. But I mean, I don't. <laughs> You're not aquatic. What am I scared of? <laughs> so, you know, here, I just I just saw this thing recently that there are two men who are competing not to find the highest place on the face of the earth, but are extreme spelunkers oh, and they're yeah. trying to find the deepest place on the yeah. face of the earth. And they say go on these trips and they're crawling through holes and they cannot see the sun for days on end. Yeah. Would you be comfortable doing that? Uh, no, caving. I mean. <laughs> Caver, With due respect stupid. to my caver <laughs> friends, it's like, yeah, the climbers go up on the outside, and, right. and, they, and then the spelunkers are just, oh, man. <laughs> so I've gone caving, I came out, and I'm like, darn it. It's wet, it's cold, there's bat guano, I mean. So you are sane. There are crazy You things. are sane, it's actually all a relative yeah. thing. You're saying yeah. that you're relatively sane, spelunkers are out of their minds. Exactly. And Lance Armstrong, he's crazy, riding that bike around, and he wipes out and all that stuff. And so it's all <laughs> choose your poison. And so I happen to know that climbing is what I've been doing. And I each time I go climbing, I build that experience upon previous expeditions. So that's what keeps me safe. Wow. Okay. Well, it's good to know who's the craziest. But <laughs> now let's talk about accomplishment. Because Mallory came out with those three dreaded words, which I think in my mind, are the worst explanation ever. Why did he want to climb Everest? Because it's there. I, I, that seems like Lindsay Lohan explaining her coke habit or something, because it's there. But <laughs> why, 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 why do it? Why, why do that? I ran the marathon, I ran it once, and I feel like I should have stopped there. And, but you ran it three or four times. I ran it two or three times, and I, and I, or three times. <laughs> I ended up like two or three, I can't remember, three times. And, uh, <laughs> but after each one, I thought, why did I do that again? This is ridiculous. I can say I ran the marathon. Oh, you were after the t-shirts. <laughs> that's right. And the so, Mylar blanket, because yeah, that's what no, keeps yeah. you warm all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, Mallory, that, those three most famous words came from Mallory in 1923. And he was in New York, mm -hmm. and he was being interviewed by a reporter from the New York Times. And he was asked, why climb Everest? And, of course, those words have been analyzed by philosophers and psychoanalysts and everyone from normal guys like you and I at behind the bar to the people that with PhDs and all that stuff. <laughs> and so they came down to these two views of it. One was that he was trying to get a pesky reporter off his back and he had a flip response. Right. Or secondly, it was a very deep, meaningful, sort of philosophical statement. And I tend to see it as the latter, that, that it is human drive to go to some place where we haven't been before. and. I mean, why did we land on the moon 16 years after the first ascent of Mount Everest? Right. I mean, are you going to say it? What? No. <laughs> because it's there? Because <laughs> it's <laughs> no, no, I, I, But here's a weird thing about the moon and about climbing Everest in my mind is that we got to the moon and we haven't done much with that. It yeah. seems like, well, we're done there. But with Everest, people have done it. You have done it. You've, you've summited the highest mountain in the world. What's, what's after that? Well, no, this one is seventh. <laughs> what, yeah. That doesn't sound as exciting. Yeah, well, there. I mean, it's the experience when yeah. you're doing it is what is good, and then being able to share that with other people and the knowledge of um, being in the mountains. And the mountains are. It's this funny joke. Uh, years ago, when I had a bazooka gum and the cartoons that got inside <laughs> of them, and it, it was like this. It's the Dorothy Parker of, of the gum world. Yes, go yeah, ahead. And so here I was, <laughs> and it was. I must have been 12 or something. Mm -hmm. I opened it up, and it said, "How do mountains hear?" And the, and the little answer was with mountain ears. <laughs> so unlike the ears of the mountains, I'm going out there and what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is that they're being threatened by the 6.7 billion people on this planet and our voracious appetite. And, and we're seeing change up there far more rapidly than we're seeing it, say, on a golf course in Kansas. Mm -hmm. So that being able to share that is, is part of why I go in the mountains.